Welcome to The Real News Network. I'm Anton Warnchuk in Baltimore. The United States is continuing airstrikes in northern Iraq in operations that could possibly take up to months. President Obama and other officials have said that the purpose of the strikes are to prevent the genocide of the Yazidi commu community by aiding the Kurdish Peshmerga forces against the Islamic State. Hundreds have been reportedly killed, and the UN is reporting barbaric, barbaric sexual violence committed by the Islamic State. But what geopolitical interests are in play in this extremely oil-rich region? Joining us from London is Dr. Nafiz Ahmed. Nafiz is a best-selling author, investigative journalist, and international security scholar who writes regularly for The Guardian. He has a new novel out now called Zero Point. And joining us from San Francisco is Antonia Yuhas. Antonia is an oil and energy analyst, a journalist, and author of three books on the oil industry, including The Tyranny of Oil and, most, in, most recently, Black Tide, The Devastating Impact of the Gulf Oil Spill. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. So Nafiz, let's start with you. Uh, can you talk about what the can you describe what the basic antagonism that has existed be, uh, between the Kurdish regional government and Baghdad since the invasion of Iraq in 2003? Well, I think I mean it goes back um, to before the 2000s invasion. Um, that in the context of um, the central government's uh, persecution of the Kurds over many years, and it's not just to do with Saddam Hussein, you know, it kind of goes even further back than that. But obviously Saddam's policies against minorities created, I think, um, certainly a, a, an aspiration amongst some of these groups to, to try and have some kind of autonomy from the central government. So there has been that historic kind of desire in that sense that has kind of given a motivation. So obviously in the post-invasion period where we've had so many problems in Baghdad, um, you know, Certainly, I think many different communities have seen um, a potential opportunity to perhaps have a better existence by trying to do things themselves, do things auto autonomously, uh, pursue self-determination. Um, I, mean, I mean, it's important to, to, to remember, I think, that um, on the mo for the most part, I think, I mean, the Iraqi people as a whole, whether they're Kurdish, Shia, Sunni, Yazidi or whatever, um, generally, you know, there was there was a, a very real sense of, of, of Iraqi national identity, but increasingly over the last decade or so, and especially in the post-invasion period, this has certainly eroded. And I think that the serious problems that we've had in the post-invasion era um, have really kind of underscored um, the levels of sectarianism and, and, and the levels of kind of suspicion that have that 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 that, is, that that we now see manifest in the in the Kurdish communities uh, attempts to kind of be much more autonomous from Baghdad. But can you also explain to the extent which the control of oil resources um, has manifested itself in this antagonism? Well, I think Antonio would probably do a better job of going into into detail on this. But um, there's certainly been um, competition between the Baghdad government and 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 the Kurdish kind of semi-autonomous. Uh, administration over how they deal with um, access to uh, Iraqi oil and of course the Kurds have their own um, they have control over their own oil resources um, but under the current arrangement um, you know there is there is what we're seeing here is this emerging kind of competition where the Kurds are trying to exert autonomy on how they basically bring that oil to market um, and how they work directly with international oil and gas companies um, and this is where we see that this is where really, really where we see where Baghdad's sovereignty uh, over, over over the Kurdish regions uh, has become has become quite contested really okay and Antonio can you can you name the the oil companies that are that are present there right now particularly in the Kurdish region and what kind of influence or power do you think they have over uh, the internal politics of Iraq Sure, and, and maybe I'll, I'll go back a little bit to some of that history first. Um, basically, with the 2003 invasion um, led by the um, Bush administration, the Kurdish region really attempted to use the invasion as a way to um, help gain its independence and really, um, in, in a significant way, just sort of handed over its oil, I would say, um, to the West and said, you know, look, we'll give you our oil if you'll help us gain independence because 
as I've argued in many places, I think one of, not the only, but certainly one of the primary objectives um, of the Bush invasion was oil. And we had the Bush administration with the help of Western oil companies actually draft a new national oil law for Iraq um, that would have granted really unheard of access to foreign oil companies to Iraqi oil, which was dubbed the Iraq oil law. Where the central Iraqi government refused to pass that law, the Kurdish region passed it and said, look, we'll give you the access that you want if you help us out. And Western oil companies, sort of some smaller ones moved into uh, the Kurdistan region fairly early on. Um, and then as the years wore on, larger oil companies started showing their interest in the Kurdistan region, especially after the central Iraqi government um, was forced, I would argue, to grant access to Western oil company, not on the incredibly generous terms that the Kurds offered, but certainly more generous terms than I imagine would have happened without um, a U.S. military occupation. So you see today companies like Exxon um, and, and with Western oil companies, BP and Shell, already on the ground operating in Iraq. In Kurdistan, like I said, smaller companies of Western oil companies um, like Hunt Oil went in early, started producing. Another company that went in um, and started producing in a big way is Janelle, which is the oil company of BP's former CEO, Tony Hayward, who was kicked out due to the BP oil spill. He now heads Janelle. He's operating um, big time in Kurdistan. Exxon, Chevron, Marathon, these companies have exploration deals in Kurdistan. They've been waiting to come in more heavily until things got worked out between the central government and the, Kurdish, and the Kurdish region. And what hasn't yet been worked out is that the Kurds are signing oil contracts, but the central Iraqi government is saying, hey, that's our oil. That's not your oil. These contracts are illegal and we're not going to let them move forward. And there's a fight between who actually controls this oil. Enter the Islamic State, enter IS. And what they've been doing is incredibly successfully using oil as a powerful weapon in their war. They've taken over fields in Syria. They've targeted infrastructure and fields in Iraq. So they're selling oil that they used in Syria to fund their advance. They're using oil that they've taken from refineries, <laughs> gasoline, excuse me, to put into cars, to put into Jeeps, to actually move their invasion forward. And now they, they moved into Kirkuk, an incredibly hotly um, debated site about whether it's in the Kurdistan region or whether it is in the central Iraq region. One of the primary reasons for the debate is the huge Kirkuk oil field, which has a massive amount of oil. Um, when it was ISIS first tried to move on the Kirkuk oil field, the Peshmerga pushed them off taking over that field and putting that field for the first time actually in the hands of the Kurds. Now ISIS is threatening really to take over all of Kurdistan and we suddenly have the Obama administration entering militarily. So I think it's doing that for two reasons. Um, one is Western oil companies in the Obama administration certainly do not want ISIS to take over Kurdistan. That's an enormous amount of oil, that oil brings power. It also takes that oil away from Western companies that would like to have it. I also think, however, that the Obama administration has entered into this game between, game is the wrong word, this dispute between Kurdistan and the central Iraqi government. And what I think the Obama administration is doing is saying, okay, we're not gonna let ISIS take over Kurdistan, but we're going to threaten the central Iraqi government with the possibility that we're gonna support Kurdistan independence unless you, the central Iraqi government, shape up. And one of the ways that they want the central Iraqi government to shape up is to get rid of Maliki, and that's in process. And the other is to better serve US interests. And I think what's happening is a military ploy to say, look, if you don't do what we want, we're ready to aid something you really don't want, which is a separate Kurdistan. Okay, and Nafiz, you've written about how um, oil, the centrality of oil in, uh, in foreign policy can be tied to the rise of the Islamic State. Can you discuss that? Well, I mean, I think it goes back, um, obviously, to really the origins of the Iraq invasion and, and what was going on in the context of 
the Bush administration's plans to, to essentially conquer Iraq. And what a lot of people don't know is that um, there are a number of different plans that were discussed. And this is not to say that these plans are necessarily coherent, but one of the plans uh, came was leaked effectively by the infamous uh, private intelligence company Stratfor. And according to Stratfor, in the year before the invasion, we had uh, a meeting between um, uh, Cheney, Vice President Cheney, um, a number of other administration officials, and he had a meeting with um, various Iraqi expatriates uh, to discuss their plan to um, get inside Iraq. And that plan was, in fact, at that time, was on, under consideration on the proposal, according to um, Jordanian officials, was a plan to basically split Iraq into three, according to ethno-sectarian lines. Um, so this was the kind of thinking that was being explored at the time. And, and the rationale, according to Stratfor, was very much about trying to ease um, the, and distribute the control of power amongst different communities in order to ease um, US access to oil and gas in Iraq. And so this was considered one of the options that they would do. Now, it's difficult to say to what extent this actually influenced uh, policy, because obviously I don't think ultimately um, administration officials or, or people in the State Department decided that, okay, we're going to split Iraq. They didn't split Iraq. Um, but what's interesting is the way in which they did actually play off different communities. And I think Antonio's get hit the nail on the head here, where we see that, again, if we have military force being used now, with the possibility that we see military force being used to effectively play off the Kurds and the central government in order for the United U.S. to get its way. Well, back then, in 2003 onwards, what was happening is, um, first of all, in the early days, we had lots of compelling evidence or, uh, from a number of intelligence sources on the ground, as well as uh, independent uh, journalists like Dahar Jamal, who, who were uh, an unembedded journalist on the ground, confirming that the United States was actually supplying arms covertly to elements of the Sunni militia who were linked to Al-Qaeda, linked to Zarqawi. Um, they were uh, in Fallujah, for example. Uh, they were undertaking psychological operations to um, support uh, elements of, of Zarqawi. And the rationale for this was to inflame what was called red-on-red -red violence. That is violence between two different types of enemy in order for the US to kind of watch them effectively kill each other and, and, and to, to kind of do the job of, of, of US special forces in the region. At the same time, um, they also were obviously financing the Shia government of Iraq, and they were also supporting, they knew very well that there were Shia, uh, Shia death squads, and they uh, supported that and allowed that to take place. So effectively, this was a divide and rule strategy uh, designed to weaken different sides and allow, uh, allow uh, the United States uh, to covertly somehow influence the direction of the conflict. But that has had a legacy. Rather than leading to a position where we have a more stable Iraq functioning in the interests of, uh, of, of, of you know, the United States or Western powers in accessing, uh, you know, regional oil and gas and so on and so forth. What we've had actually is, is that the, this legacy has lived on and we now have these very virulent factions. And the policy has continued when we look at what's been happening in Syria, uh, in Lebanon, uh, across the region in the Middle East, we see that there is this overall policy that under the Bush administration began, which was to essentially to fund um, various uh, Sunni militant factions, many of them linked to Al-Qaeda, to mobilize um, the Saudis, the, the Qataris, the Kuwaitis, to effectively give funding to these groups in the region in order to counter Iranian influence. And this policy has continued and it kind of uh, was ramped up in Syria in order to propel the rebellion against against Assad, who, of course, um, was attempting to put down um, a very real uh, uprising. But in this process, um, this influx of money and arms and logistical training, and we know that U.S. Special Forces and British Special Forces and uh, were actually in Syria uh, by some accounts as early as 2009, according to the French Foreign Minister. Um, so there was this input going on, and, and they were liaising effectively with not just the secular rebels, but harnessing the, the, the regional power of, of the Saudis and, and, and the other Gulf states. And, and obviously these guys funded the people that they know very well and have worked with in the past, which is effectively these mercenaries, many of them Islamist groups linked to Al-Qaeda. And that has effectively spilled over from Syria um, into Iraq. Um, and 
effectively we have this so this is really the blowback of, of a policy which has been designed to um maneuver the region in many in, in different ways into a direction that fits various pipeline plans um and you know we now see that this has actually resulted in, in something that you know analysts did not foresee happening in the way it was in, in the way it is really happening now okay nafiz ahmed and antonio yuhas thank you both for joining us thank you thanks and thank you for joining us on the real news network